Hello everybody, this is Jörg once again from YouTube channel Jogler66 with another reading of Rulers of Evil under titles Useful Knowledge About Governing Bodies. Last time <coughs> we left off in the middle of chapter 12. I told you before that it's a very long chapter, so I knew I had to split it in two parts to get it also on Block Talk Radio where we are limited to 45 minutes broadcast, but that's no problem so the attention span has a little pause in between. That's not bad. I will now continue reading in Rules of Evil, chapter 12, but for continuous sake I will back up two paragraphs that I've read already on page 131 of the PDF. Louis XV, being an absolute monarch, parliamentary resolutions were worthless without his signature. Louis, being obedient to his Jesuits, was highly unlikely that he would ever sign a resolution condemning the Jesuits. Yet, sign it, he did. And why he did, as remained a point of debate. Some say his mistress, Madame de Pompadour, craved vengeance against court Jesuits for implacably denying her a mass. Others say the king needed Parliament's favour to bail him out of debt. I submit, that's Tapa Saucy, I submit that Louis signed because Lorenzo Ricci wanted him to. That means that he even wanted him, the Jesuits, to get banned out of France, because he has an agenda that he has not told you yet. When the resolution became law, Ricci released the French Jesuits from their vows. The society as an institution ceased to exist on French soil. Louis consented to allow the Jesuits to remain in France, but as regular clergy. Others went into exile. Père de Vallette, whose financial problems had brought to it, uh, on, on the debacle, was exiled by Ritchie to live the rest of his life as a private citizen in England. When the war that had begun in the Ohio Valley reached Martinique, the English occupied that tiny island and took over the Jesuit plantations, selling them, slaves and all, for more than enough money to have paid off Lavalette's debts. In the midst of their decomposing glory, the Jesuits received from Clement XIII an awesome gift designed to make welcome the most humiliating of circumstances. This was the mass and office of the Sacred Heart, with its icon of a realistically blood bloody heart plucked from Christ's ribcage and ignited by an eternal flame. Based on visions resulting from the spiritual exercises made by St. Margaret Marie Alacoque <coughs> between 1647 and 1690, as promoted by her Jesuit spiritual director Claude de la Colombière, Sacred Heart is a Gnostic Jesuit production centering on the Savior's perfect humanity. Quote, by devotion to my heart, unquote, Jesus, uh, Jesus supposedly revealed to Alacoque, Quote, Tepid souls shall grow fervent, and fervent sh souls shall quickly mount to a high perfection. Unquote. Sacred Heart summons true believers to pay a debt of quote unquote, reparation for the world's sins. The debt is payable only by prayers, penances, masses, and, significantly for this epoch in the society's history, social action. John Carroll, so indispensable for the outworking of the American Revolution, was profoundly devoted to Sacred Heart. Louis XV was the effective head of the family compact, an agreement between reigning Bourbon monarchs to present a united front before the rest of the world, quote-unquote, on important measures. Once he had dissolved the Jesuits in France, he advised other Bourbons to do likewise. Although he could not name anything to be gained politically, economically or financially by the society's dissolution, the issue, quote, still remains puzzling and problematic, unquote, Professor Martin says, unless considered, I submit, Tapa Saucy, in light of Sun Tzuan ruse. At any rate, the, Bourbons, the Bourbon Charles III of Spain followed Louis' advisory. Charles convened a special commission to prepare a master plan for ousting the Jesuits. No one could produce any hard evidence against the society. But there were plenty of rumors. 
a mob that had risen up to protest a law Charles had passed forbidding the wearing of white sombreros was said to have been fomented by Jesuits. A rumor swept across Spain that the Jesuits were nursing a plot to assassinate Charles. The Jesuits supposedly had proof that the king was technically a bastard and should be deposed. None of these rumors were ever substantiated. Moreover, General Ritchie ordered the Jesuits to do nothing to dispel them. The result was that 46 of the 60 Spanish bishops decided that Spain should follow the Marquis de Pombal and oust the society. And so the commission drafted an expulsion order, which Charles signed on February 27, 1767. The order was executed by ambush, reminiscent of Philip IV's move against the Knights Templar in 1312. Charles sent out sealed envelopes marked, quote, not to be opened before sunrise of April the 2nd on pain of death, unquote, to all provincial viceroys and military commanders. When sunrise came and the recipients opened their envelopes, they discovered two letters inside. The first ordered them to place troops around the Jesuit residences and colleges during the night of April the 2nd to arrest all Jesuits and to arrange for them to be placed aboard waiting ships at certain docks. Quote, if a single Jesuit, concluded the king, even though sick or dying, is still to be found in the area under your command after the embarkation, prepare yourself to face summary execution. Unquote. The second letter was a copy of King Charles' original order of expulsion, which began, quote, being swayed by just and legitimate reasons, which shall remain sealed within my royal breast forever, unquote. and went on to say that, quote, all members of the Society of Jesus are to leave my kingdom, Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and the other formerly independent kingdoms that made up Spain, and all their goods are declared forfeit, by virtue of the highest power which the Lord Almighty has confided into my hands." Unquote. The king made sure to discourage any investigation into causes. Quote, it is not for subjects to question the wisdom or to seek to interpret the decisions of their sovereign. <laughs> Now, isn't that interesting? At that time, at least, politicians told the people, my decisions are not worth of discussing for you. There surely was not a democracy or a republic or whatever. The king could do as he wanted to do. And if he said, I make decisions that I do not want the people to discuss about or whatever, because they are too dumb anyway, he just said it is not for subjects to question the wisdom or to seek to interpret the decisions of their sovereign. The sovereign is untouchable. That's always the same. Look at the Pope today. It's the same thing. He is the judge of all men, yet he cannot be judged by man. I just want to insert this. I have to get that rid of my. Uh, I have to get it off my chest. You know this Peter and that starting. Um, not only the investigation, but also the persecution of the Pope because of the pedophile agenda, the Roman Catholic Church has, and he wants to bring all these parts to the to the to the clergy to the court. I always said he can do that as much as he wants. Under canon law, the Pope is untouchable, and because all these courts are obeying canon law, you can never touch him. You cannot question the sovereign. In this case, here, uh, in the book, it's about the King of Spain, and in the other case, it's the King of the World, the Antichrist, the Pope, sitting in Rome. He cannot be judged by men, and never will be. God will judge him. He is the righteous one to judge him. Let that over to him. But for us, the very important work to expose him, and that's what I applaud Kevin Annette for, that he does that. 
absolutely I applaud him to that because he makes people aware of the pedophile problem within the Roman Catholic Church. He will not have the success that he wants to have, but that's because the things are the way they are. But at least he makes people attend of the fact of the global Vatican pandemic pedophile agenda that's all over the world. Okay, I just had to insert that here, so... You know, it's not only a reading, I also give my opinion. And you can agree or you can disagree. I really do not care very much, but um, I'm looking forward to your comments on this maybe later on in the video. Then. Okay, I'll continue reading now. Only days before April the 2nd, the Spanish ambassador to the Holy See presented a document from Charles to Pope Clement XIII that explained, quote, your holiness knows as well as anyone else that a sovereign's first duty is to ensure the peace of his dominions and the tranquility of his subjects. In the fulfillment of this sovereign task, I have found it necessary to expel all the Jesuits residing in my kingdoms and to commit them directly to your holiness's wise stewardship in the states of the church. I beg your holiness to consider that my decision is unalterable and has been made as a result of mature reflection and all due consideration for the consequences. Unquote. Clement, the likelihood uh, of whose submission to the will of Lorenzo Ricci should not be underestimated, responded in a melodramatic vein, as though playing for an audience. Quote, of all the shocks I have had to endure in the nine unhappy years of my pontificate, this one, of which your majesty has informed me, is the worst. Unquote. The Pope had little more to say, except that the king may have placed himself in danger of eternal damnation. The order was executed during the night of April 2nd and 3rd. Some 6,000 6, Jesuits were rounded up throughout Spain. They were crammed into the lower decks of 22 warships. In May 1767 the gruesome fleet appeared off uh, Civita... Oh my, that, that, that's a different city to read. <laughs> Civita Vecchia, the port of the Papal States and, amazingly, was fired upon by shore at artillery. The ships were denied permission to land their human cargo by order of the Pope himself, pursuant to a conference with Lorenzo Ricci. Historians are at loss to explain why Clement, so devoted to the Jesuits, would impose such cruelty upon his beloved and their hour of need. The most plausible answer I would suggest, suggest is that his understanding was obedient to the inscrutable command of his general, whose exceedingly private objective, after all, was to disqualify the Society of Jesus and the Roman Catholic Church as viable enemies of Protestantism, at least in the North American colonies. No longer enemies, they could develop personal alliances. The suffering priests, the guns of Civita Vecchia, were all explained in Amiot's son too. Quote, your army, accustomed to not knowing your plans, will be equally unaware uh, of the peril which threatens it. A good general takes advantage of everything, but he can only do that because he has operated in the greatest secrecy because he knows how to remain cool-headed and because the government with uprightness. At the same time, however, his men are constantly misled by what they see and hear. He manages for his troops never to know what they must do nor what, the orders, nor what orders they must receive. If his own people are unaware of his plans, how can the enemy discover them?" Unquote. Over the next few months, thousands more Jesuits were expelled from the remaining Bourbon states of Naples, Parma, Malta and Spanish America. Jesuits in French America, Quebec, 
and New England were left undisturbed, as were those in Austria. In October 1768, the Austrian Empress Maria Theresa, a Habsburg, wrote her Jesuit confessor, confessor Father Koffler, quote, My dear father, there is no cause for concern. As long as I am alive, you have nothing to fear, unquote. But Maria Theresa hoped to marry her two daughters to Bourbon princes, Caroline to the son of the Spanish king, Marie Antoinette to the son of Louis XV. Bourbon ambassadors advised her that unless she expelled the Jesuits, she would have to look elsewhere for sons-in-law. The Empress Renegade... Difficult word, so I start the sentence again. The Empress reneged of her compromise to Father Koffler, expelled the Jesuits, and the girls got them in. Marie Antoinette's marriage would end with the execution of her husband, Louis XVI, in January 1793. Nine months later, she would die the same way, decapitated by the guillotine. This device bears the name of the French revolutionist who in 1792 first suggested it, its use in administering the death penalty, Dr. Joseph Guillotine. Dr. Guillotine was a disestablished Jesuit. Now, who wonders about that? And I'm going to tell you right now, there is proof out there that in the United States of America, for the moment, more than 30,000 guillotines are standing ready for the Protestants that will not bow down to the new laws coming out of Rome. What are these new laws? Sunday law, first of all, the new, what they administer as hate speech, speaking the truth, being a protestant, being, how can I say that, just against canon law. There will be a lot of cases where in America these guillotines will probably be used. I don't think that they bought them just because they had too much money. They will certainly use them. And this was, uh, of course, also used in the time of the French Revolution. So this comes from Dr. Joseph Guillotine. Hmm? Interesting. Right in time, right? And of course, that this guy has Jesuit connections. Uh, he was a disestablished Jesuit. That the guillotine comes from a Jesuit is absolutely no wonder to me. When you know the Jesuits, you know how bad they are. Remember, when the Jesuits or when Ignatius of Loyola was content with the Inquisition the Pope set up, then they went into what is called the Council of Trent, the Counter-Reformation. They have everything to do with decapitating everybody who is not doing what they teach, who is not believing what they teach, who is not doing what they teach, who is not living what they teach, who is not breathing what they teach, when you are not under the Jesuit power, you will probably lose your head. And Marie Antoinette was one of the persons who experienced that firsthand. And history, as you know, always repeats itself. Okay, continue reading now. In January 1769, the ambassadors of France, Spain and Portugal visited Clement XIII to demand, quote, the complete and utter suppression of the Society of Jesus, unquote. Clement called for a special consistory on the College of Cardinals to deliberate the question. But when the Cardinals convened on February 3rd, it was not to discuss Bourbon ultimatums, but to choose Clement's successor. Oh! <laughs> for the 76-year-old Pope had died the night before, quote, of an epileptic attack, unquote, said the official record, a heart, <coughs> a heart attack attributed to the pressures applied by Bourbon diplomats. Well, I doubt that personally, but yeah, the Jesuits are the masters of poison, right? For nearly three months, one question charged the turbulent conclave. Should the next Pope be for or against the Jesuits? The Cardinal's choice of Lorenzo Ganganelli was a triumph for Lorenzo Ricci. 
Although Ganganelli was a Franciscan, he had colleagued with Jesuits as a special consultant to the Inquisition. His celebrated book, Diatriba Theologica, from 1743, had been dedicated to Ignatius Loyola. Moreover, Ganganelli literally owed his papacy to Lorenzo Ricci. It was Ricci who had sponsored his nomination for cardinal in 1759. Almost immediately after receiving the red <coughs> that Ganganelli had shown evidence of cooperation with General Ricci's strategy of gradually disestablishing the Society of Jesus, Oxford Book of Popes indicates a sudden and unexplainable habit change. Quote, Hitherto, regarded as a friend of the Jesuits, Cardinal Ganganelli now distanced himself from them. Unquote. And now, a decade later, calling himself Clement the Fourteenth, Ganganelli presented what the Catholic Encyclopedia calls quote, "in appearance a hostile attitude" unquote, toward the Jesuits and apparent hostility, a theatrical hostility that masked an involved loyalty toward the society. Clement the Fourteenth would do whatever was necessary to help the society win victory without doing a battle, even if it meant obliterating the society. The Bourbons needed appeasing. Hastily, Clement promised Charles III of Spain forthcoming documents necessary to quote, proclaim to all the world the wisdom of your majesty's decision to expel the Jesuits as unruly and rebellious subjects. Unquote. He assured Louis XV of France also of a quote, plan for the complete suppression of this society. Unquote. On Monday, Thursday, 1770, Clement omitted the annual reading of an in coena domini, meaning on the Lord's Supper. The omission was an astonishing statement. This celebrated bull, first proclaimed in 1568 by Pope Pius V, arrogantly reminded kings that they were but vessels of the papacy. Suddenly discontinuing this assertion flattered the royal self-importance, inviting crowned heads to stay on the anti-Jesuit, anti-church track so necessary for the fulfillment of Lorenzo Ricci's secret designs in England and America. It surely evidences Clement's involvement in the strategy of feigned weakness in order to conceal what Sun Tzu called, quote, an order that nothing can interrupt, unquote. The non-reading of In Quema Domini rang the death knell of a strong-armed white papacy as manifest by Ricci's political theorist, quote, Justinius Febronius, unquote, in his 1763 masterpiece on the state of the church and the legitimate power of the Roman pontiff, about which more presently. For more than 80 years, the papacy had supported Rome-based members of the Stuart monarchs exiled from England for being Roman Catholics. Not only did Clement XIV diminish this a tradition to almost nothing, in 1772 he began extending a highly visible and most cordial hospitality to the Protestant King George III and his family. This tableau was enormously disturbing to American Protestants, who at that time were having extreme difficulties with George. The prospect of England reuniting with Rome gave them all the more the reason to strive for what Lorenzo Ricci wanted. Their independence! Here you got it! How do you make all these people all of a sudden say we have to divide from Protestant England from our mother nation, although we are also Protestant, why are we going away from Protestant England? The prospect of England reuniting with Rome gave them all the more the reason to strive for what Lorenzo Ricci wanted, their independence. And a few years later they got it. Finally, on July the 21st, 1773, Clement XIV delivered on his promise by signing the brief Dominus ac Redemptor Noster, God and our Redeemer. The brief, quote, dissolved, suppressed, disbanded, and 
uh, abolished, unquote, the society of Jesus, quote, unquote, for all eternity, so as, quote, to establish a real and enduring peace with the church, unquote. All the Jesuits' offices, authorities and functions were declared null and void, and all their houses, colleges, hospices and any other place occupied by them to, the, to be hereby disestablished, no matter in what province, state or kingdom they might be found. Unquote. Clement appointed five cardinals, an archbishop, a bishop, two theologians and other ecclesiastical dignitaries, to supervise the disestablishment. None of the confiscated Jesuit records, correspondence and accounts showed any incriminating evidence. Although the Lorenzo Ricci lived a short walk from the Pope's palace at St. Peter's, notice that this establishment was not served upon him until mid-August. Guards took the general into custody at his offices in number 45 Piazza del Gesù. That's in the center of Rome. They removed him to the English college a few blocks away. He remained there five weeks. Things were then happening in England and America that make Ritchie's presence in the English college extraordinarily significant. We shall consider those happenings in a forthcoming chapter. <laughs> I told you, chapter 12 is absolutely vital to understand the real reasons for the founding of the nation of United States of America. Toward the end of September, Lorenzo Ricci was taken from the English college to Castel Sant'Angelo, a medieval fortress whose dungeons suggest a prison. His detention was probably less demean, uh, demeaning than we might imagine, as St. Angelo contained quite elegant rooms. Popes often used them as a convenient resort from administrative stress. In fact, a secret underground tunnel connected St. Angelo to the Papal Palace at the Vatican. It would be consistent with Lorenzo Ricci's position and strategy for him to stay in personal, secret contact with Clement XIV by means of this tunnel. On September 22, 1774, the first anniversary of Ricci's detention at St. Angelo, Clement died. He was 69. He had suffered the last year of his life in severe depression. It was set with morbid paranoia over assassination. His corpse decomposed rapidly, feeding rumors of death by poison, rumors which his famous last words tended to confirm. Quote, mercy! Mercy! Compulsus feshi! I was compelled to do it. For many years afterward, Historians would wonder just whom Giangianelli was addressing. God? A vengeful Jesuit assassin? Ritchie? What was the it he was compelled to do? Disestablish the Jesuits? Commit suicide? The definitive answer may never be known, because the Pope's personal papers and effects decomposed as rapidly as his flesh. What is quite known, though, is that the death of Clement XIV, in the words of Oxford Book of Papes, quote, brought the prestige of the papacy to its lowest level in centuries, which is precisely what Lorenzo Ricci needed for his American revolution to happen. I just need to insert here another quote of Pope uh, Clement XIV, and um, this is the one that you probably have read before. Pope Clement XIV, who had, quote-unquote, forever established, abolished, sorry, <laughs> abolished the Jesuit order in 1773, said, quote, Alas, I knew they, the Jesuits, would poison me, but I did not expect to die in a slow and cruel manner. I think this is the most um, knowing quote from, uh, from from this Pope, Clement XIV, and I think it is quite appropriate to insert that here into the reading of the book Rulers of Evil. I will now continue with the 
the last paragraph on page 138 of the PDF, if you follow the reading. We now proceed to examine the structured darkness of the men who led the attack against the Society of Jesus. It was the same darkness from whence came not only the Englishmen who turned their kingdoms into a hatred tyranny, but also the Americans who advocated rebellion against that tyranny. The darkness is called Freemasonry, and it is the subject of our next chapter. So finally now we stopped, uh, uh, we concluded chapter 12 of Rulers of Evil in just half an hour. Look at this, 75 minutes altogether. I'm glad I did this reading in one. Um, yeah, of course, there was a break in between that you didn't know, but uh, I took this afternoon off to do this because I really wanted to read this. And you will see when we go into the next chapters of Rulers of Evil, by the way, the next chapter is called The Secret Bridge and starts with a quotation from Stephen C. Bullock from the Revolutionary Brotherhood from 1996. Quote, the papal prohibition might even have encouraged masonry by identifying opposition to the group with Catholic tyranny and superstition. Unquote. The same sentence that Rulers of Evil author Tapasosi just wrote here. So, um, this has come to a conclusion with chapter 12. I thank you all for listening and watching. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'm really having a great time here doing this and uh, I hope to encourage other people to read the book too. And you know, there are some people, I just want to get that rid of my chest. There are some people who, uh, who accuse me of being anti-American because I'm a European and I bash the Americans for the founding of their nation and for being the second beast of Revelation 13 and all the bad things coming out of America. Well, that's facts. I can't help that. But why should I have anything against any American person that I do not even know? From my heritage, I am German. And... <laughs> 99% of the Germans I speak, I, I speak to and I speak to do not accept me and do not accept the things that I say. Germany is being as bad as the United States of America, if you ask me. I'm not American bashing. No, I am even so dumb as a European to read a book written by an American over the American history I am, as a European, even teaching Americans their history, which is so important. Because when you do not have history, you do not have a right view on the present time. And you surely cannot make predictions for the future. So, bashing on me, being anti-American, is just stupid. I love America. The country is a wonderful country. The people are, as far as I know, a lot of them, wonderful people. But the government of the Americans, oh my dear. Like the government of where I live, Belgium, where I come from, Germany, where I live in, Europe. It's damnable. It is out of any biblical substance. It is purely living in the lands of the Antichrist, under the laws of the Antichrist. And I don't like that. And that's why I pro protest it. I protest that here in Belgium. I protest that here on YouTube and I do that with anyone that I talk to. These damnable Jesuits this Antichrist Roman Catholic Church, the Church, the hierarchy, the institutions, not the street man who believes in Catholicism, who has been raised that way, who doesn't know any better, who has never opened his eyes to the real truth, who has not a chance to see that these people I'm talking to these people I want to wake up, like you, dear listener. I love everyone, as Jesus commanded us to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. I have no problem with that. But 
I point out the errors in your thinking that you have because you haven't been thinking for yourself but being indoctrinated by Jesuitical studio ratiorum, by learning against learning, by everyone taken out God of their lives. I'm just trying to put God back into your lives. I try to put knowledge back into your life. Knowledge and wisdom that you can understand what is going on and that when you say I'm a patriot that maybe rings a bell and says oh, okay I'm a patriot but what can I do if the people who are in my government are not patriots. All the governments in the world whether it be in uh, over there in the United States of America whether it be over here in the European Union whether it be in China or Russia or Australia or Africa or whatever the leaders of the countries only pledge allegiance to one kingdom and that is the kingdom of Antichrist the fourth kingdom that Daniel foretold to be the last kingdom of this earth. It started off with Babylon, it went over to Medio Persia, that went over to Greece and after that it went to Rome. Rome is divided in twice in two different times or two different ways to say that. It was the legs of iron that was pagan Rome and it is the food of iron mixed with miry clay and that is what we are living in today. And this figure, this statue envisioned by Daniel will be destroyed by the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the stone that is not cut out with hands. And I really have to get that rid of my chest right now. You can call me a America basher as long as you want. I've never bashed any American person personally because I do not even know them and I am not to judge anybody that I do not know. But I can, on the authority of the 1611 King James Bible, I can make judgments on the governments of the earth the governments of the United States of America, the government of Belgium where I live in, the government of the European Union, of all these people who are being controlled and led by the Antichrist and all his minions. That is not only the Society of Jesus, that's on the top, okay, but that's also Freemasonry, that's Opus Dei, that's Knights of Columbus, for you guys over there in the United States of America. The, the Knights of Columbus are special, a special part of the Knights of Malta founded only for the United States of America. And please get for once into the study of what the Knights of Malta really are. I have a video uploaded on my channel that I uh, uh, that was a conversation that I did some time ago with Michael Adams when I was still with him on uh, Nothing But The Truth and we did a very good video explaining the power of the sovereign military order of Malta. It's more than two hours long. Please watch it and you will see how that goes into there. So I'm not bashing America as long as I'm not bashing Germany or England or whatever. I'm bashing the governments. I love the people. Really, I do. I love Catholics. I don't like their belief system. I don't like the hierarchy they belong to. I don't like that they are brainwashed in that sense that they have no idea that they follow a wrong religion. But therefore I make it my work to explain it to them and try to tell them where so-called Christianity, because when today you speak about Christianity, you always speak about Catholics. You speak about the Roman Catholic Church. How that was hijacked by just taking up um, by just taking up all these pagan symbols uh, from the time. You know, the, the Roman Empire is, is, uh, is or, or the Roman Catholic Church is nothing else than the Roman Empire baptized baptized into Christianity. Just go to Rome. And if you don't go to Rome, just take a picture, take a look at St. Peter's. 
Take a look at the statue of St. Peter in the Vatican. Do your research. That's Jupiter. So they changed the name because all of a sudden the pagan Rome got Christianized. It has nothing to do with original Christianity. Where did ever the Pope of Rome or the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy ever teach the true gospel of Jesus Christ? Tell me. Write me. Let me know. I guess you can't. So then you maybe have to start to do your own research in that direction. And for the last time, I love people. I don't hate Americans. My best friends are Americans. Walt Stickle over there in Oregon. Tom Fress over there in, I don't know, what's it, Ohio or whatever. Somewhere he lives. I don't know. I don't care. It's the brother that counts for me, not the place he lives in or what he does or whatever. Those are legitimate persons. And those are the people I care for and those, for the, those are the people I do this for. I do this for God, I do this for Jesus, but I also do this for my friends. I want to get this information out and I want to make all of you my friends by getting this information out and by telling you what it's really all about. And whether you become my friend and like me or you become my enemy because I have spoken the truth and for that I have become your enemy. Well, it's a shame. But that happens, you know. I will survive. I will survive this. I will survive a lot of things. Until the Lord calls me to him. And being honest, I can't wait. What does this earth has to offer me? Only, the only thing this earth has to offer me is the work that I'm doing here by reading Tapa Saucy's book, Rulers of Evil, by doing my broadcasts on Hour of the Truth, by doing all the stuff that I'm doing, this is all the world has to offer me. And for the rest, I don't care. I want my peace in a kingdom of righteousness, without lies, without deception, but with love, with grace, humidity, and I want to be with my Father, and I want to be with my Master, my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for me 2,000 years ago on the cross for redemption of my sins that I cannot help to commit. I believe in Jesus as my Savior, and I try to walk as close in His footsteps as I can. So, this has nothing to do with the reading of Rulers of Evil, but I had to inject that here sometimes, and really, if you want to, write a comment on that. Agree with me, disagree with me. In the end, I don't care. Because it takes nothing to go with the crowd, but it takes everything stand alone. By this I'm signing off, having done the complete reading of chapter 12 of Rulers of Evil, useful knowledge about governing bodies, and I will see you soon again, maybe, or just after this ranting, not anymore. I don't care, it's your decision. It's for you that I'm doing this. I would have read the book on myself also. It's much more difficult to do that on an audio and put it later in a video. It's all work, time consuming. And I'm not doing that for me. I'm doing that for the Lord. That is the way the Lord has called me out to serve Him. And that's the way I will serve Him until I'm dead, whether you like it or not. So, thank you very much for your attention. For following the reading of Rulers of Evil, maybe even for following here and there my YouTube channel. I love you all. Until the next time, God bless you. Bye-bye.